Hi, my name is Kai and I have Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD. I wanted to make this video to help others who are considering a formal diagnosis, who are currently in that process, or just wanting to know more about the diagnosis in general. Um, if you have questions, feel free to leave a comment below or send me a message through any of the links in the description. In the future, if I make more videos about ASD, I'll link those below in the description as well. Um, some of the topics I'm going to be going over today are some basic information about me, uh, why I sought out a diagnosis, what the diagnosis entailed, and the test that I took, um, and how I felt immediately after the diagnosis, and how I currently feel now about the diagnosis. Before I get started with my diagnosis story, I just wanted to make a general disclaimer. So I am not an autism spectrum disorder expert. Um, I have my bachelor's degree in psychology and I have spent a lot of time engaging with the autism community online. Uh, however, I am not an expert on like ASD in general, but I am the expert in my own experiences. Um, with that being said, um, you know, don't take everything I say and apply it to yourself. I'm going to be telling you about my story and my personal experiences. If you find some things that resonate with you, then I suggest that you maybe um, do some research on your own. And I'm going to be putting some of the sources I talk about later um, in the description and check those out. However, <laughs> explore at your own risk. Um, and lastly, I'm going to be using identity first language um, because this is how I tell my story and that's what I feel comfortable with. Identity first language is saying um, autistic person versus saying person with autism. I first want to acknowledge that I have a lot of privilege in the fact that I was able to obtain a formal diagnosis as an adult. Um, I will say now that some, if not most people who self-diagnose are valid. Um, as someone who's gone through the process and jumped through the hoops of getting a formal diagnosis, it is not a neurodivergent friendly process and it was incredibly expensive. In my case, my diagnosis was a total of $1,600 and I was able to pay for it offer, um, I was able to pay for it through a payment plan offered by the company I went through. Um, the original price though for it was $2,000, but I ended up not needing one of the tests. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and I want to acknowledge this first, uh, just because I know how hard it is for a lot of people in the community to get a formal diagnosis. And I'm going to recommend if you are seeking a formal diagnosis to like carefully think it over financially and see if, you know, if the company you're going through or if your insurance is going to cover it. Um, but kind of also acknowledging my privilege, I want to also um, just talk about some of the other identities I hold. Um, so I identify as a transgender masculine person, meaning that when I was born, I was assigned female at birth, but my gender identity is masculine. Um, and I can make a whole other video about like my gender and transness related to ASD. Um, but I wanted to make this video the topic of autism. Um, but I also just kind of throw in that my sexual orientation is queer or gay. Um, and also on top of that, I had a very non-traditional kind of upbringing. Uh, I was raised by a single mom who had pretty severe mental illness. And my father passed away when I was around two. And I'm also not a white person, and those experiences have impacted me as well. And I'm acknowledging a lot of these identities I have because when I was going through the process of searching a, or considering getting a formal diagnosis, I saw a lot of videos made by um, women who are on the spectrum who got diagnosed as an adult. And that was helpful for me in some aspects, but you know, I. There's a lot of like queer and trans people in the autism community. Um, and so I just wanted to share my perspective of that. And I also wanna know that the lines between my queerness, my transness and my environment, my autism are not very clear cut. Meaning I'm not exactly sure where one symptom or behavior comes from. 
um, and I'm not super interested in that. At the end of the day, this is just who I am and I just wanted to share my story. So there were a couple of things that led up to my decision for seeking out a formal diagnosis. And I can make another video going more in depth into the reasons why, um, but I will condense it for this video. Um, and just so everything in this timeline is kind of clear, um, I'm filming this in 2020 um, and I received my formal ASD diagnosis in 2018. Um, and I was in I was in my undergraduate degree program from 2014 until 2020 or 2019, my bad. Um, but essentially one of the main reasons why I sought out a formal diagnosis was to obtain academic accommodations. Um, all throughout school and into college, I struggled a lot with school, um, more so when I was younger. Uh, however, as I was growing older, I was learning new like coping mechanisms and, you know, utilizing the resources available to me. Um, however, in combination with this, I was also um, really, really struggling with depression. And while I was making some progress in therapy, it never felt like I was being fully treated or it felt like maybe something deeper was not being evaluated. Um, in 2017, I was diagnosed with ADHD, primarily inattentive, and the diagnose and with that diagnosis, I gained some clarity about how my brain works, and in it and it seemed to explain some of the things, and it still does. Um, and by the way, that diagnosis was very much unplanned. I was. Um, seeing a psychiatrist for the first time because when I was initially starting my treatment for depression, I, saw, I, I went and had a, doc, a doctor's appointment with my general practitioner um, and he prescribed me a medication, but a lot of my symptoms got worse. And so I sought out a psychiatrist instead and she diagnosed me with ADHD and they switched my meds and the medication really helped in terms of helping some things, especially with executive dysfunction. Um, but it, it wasn't like the full picture. There were still some things that didn't seem quite right. Um, and this also was all happening in college. And so sometimes it's a little hard for me to parse out when certain events happened. Um, but I do know that during all of this, I started engaging more with the LGBTQ community on campus. And basically it's, it's kind of interesting. Like there's a lot of people in the LGBTQ community who are neurodivergent. Um, and I met a lot of other autistic people in that community. And it was kind of interesting how I kind of stumbled more into like, learning about autism. And I was learning a little bit more about autism through, you know, interacting with like the ADHD community because there's a lot of overlap. But, you know, essentially one of the things that like a lot of the college aid kids like to do was um, take tests and one of the, I, cat, and one of the tests that they we're taking was something called the Autism Spectrum Quotient, or the AQ, and it's a test that is very flawed in some ways, but I think it is somewhat helpful in terms of like understanding how autism can look like. And I remember the first time I took that test, I scored a 38 out of 50, and you know, then the, that test said, and I quote, um, indicates a strong likelihood of Asperger syndrome or autism. And I found that very interesting because I had never really had like a good idea about like what autism meant. Hi, um, I forgot to film this part, but I just wanted to say before you all go running off to take the AQ test, I just wanted to say that AQ is not a perfect measurement tool. So even if you get the same score as me or if you score higher or whatever, that doesn't 100% mean that you have ASD. Um, that being said, I'm still going to link it in the description, but just, you know, be aware of that and explore your own risk. So some of the 
like ideas I had about autism were um, not entirely correct. Um, I have written here a couple of notes. Um, I mentioned earlier that my degree was in psychology and I took a couple of classes that went over psychological disorders. Um, and one of my classes, which was abnormal psychology, um, here's kind of what I wrote. It says one in 68 kids affected 80% uh, are boys and 90% remain severely disabled into adulthood and are unable to lead independent lives. Um, and that was, I took that class in the fall of 2015. Um, and in the spring of 2017, 2017, I took a class called clinical neuropsychology and I wrote this, one in 1000 kids, lack of empathy, asocial, slow to speak, unable to engage in conversation, rocking, headbanging, and perseveration on routines, rituals, and object manipulation. And I'm not trying to, you know, make a jab at my professors or any way. They did a good job. I mean, it was, it's pretty hard to cover like, you know, every single disorder in depth. Um, and you know what a lot of different presentations of that disorder can look like. However, this did, color my worldview in terms of like how autism can look like. And for me, I interpreted that as, you know, basically people who don't look like me have autism. After all of this though, I was starting to get curious. And so I decided to do my own kind of research. Um, and, you know, a lot of the research I was doing that focused on like you know, being diagnosed with autism in adulthood uh, very much relates to women or people who was, who are assigned female at birth. Um, and, you know, for um, by definition, as a trans person, I'm very aware of, you know, my sex assigned at birth and, like, how I grew up. Um, and, you know, reading, I was reading some of the books, um, and I'll link some of the ones I read below, and those are really helpful in terms of, you know, reading someone else's personal experience and being able to resonate so much with it. And I can go into more detail later about, you know, like signs I had as a kid when I was growing up or um, things like that. However, when I was doing a lot of this explo exploratory, exploratory research, um, I was very quiet about it. Um, there was a lot of stigma and there still kind of is in the autism community about being self-diagnosed and at that time I wasn't really um, using that label. I wasn't really out to a lot of people talking about it. Um, and this, all of this kind of like happened in between the years of 2016 and 2018 and I didn't really tell a lot of people about it um, but you know I do remember telling a couple of people and this one ex-friend, you could say, um, I told her, you know, what I was going through and thinking I was on the spectrum. And she essentially told me that uh, she didn't think I had autism because I could maintain eye contact and I cared about her feelings. Um, so yeah, I mean, hence the title of ex-friend. <laughs> Um, but all of these experiences, and I'm sure there are more that I'm just like not remembering right now, reached like a boiling point for me and it just kind of, you know, encouraged me to seek out an official diagnosis to obtain some clarity. So the diagnostic process I went through included the following, um, a general interview about my, you know, experiences growing up, the behavioral ob observations the psychologist had, um, the ADOS 2 or the Autism Diagnostic Obs Observation Schedule, second edition, the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale, or just the IQ test, um, Behavioral Rating Inventory of Executive Function, or the Brief A, Integrated Visual and Auditory uh, 2 Continuous Performance Test, or the Sustained Attention Test, and the Millen Clinical Multiaxle um, inventory for. Um, the test I didn't take was something called the ADIR or the Autism Diagnostic Interview. Um, and it's an interview usually done with uh, the parents of people who are seeking out the diagnosis. 
Um, however, like during this time, my mom passed away in 2016 and I didn't really have any other um, adult people I was still in contact with who like knew me as a child. Um, so that's also one of the reasons why like my test was cheaper was because I didn't have um, that additional test. Uh, and the reason why like, or, or I guess like one of these um, tests are not traditionally used in an autism evaluation and that's the um, Millen Clinical Multi-Axle Inventory 4 and that's like your personality inventory essentially. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that more in depth later. Um, so I won't be going into what specific scores I got on the tests, um, but I will summarize kind of what the test measures and what my results kind of were, um, and I'll keep it as jargon-free as I possibly can. Um, so the interview focused on my developmental history mainly, uh, you know, my family history, education and work experience, uh, my social and emotional history. Um, and she asked me about like, this, basically like special interests and like rituals and routines. Um, and I won't go too much in depth here because that's very personal information. Um, but moving on, the behavioral observations were just kind of part of the entire experience. I did all the testing in one day, by the way, which was not a great idea. I was, I'm not even kidding, like five or six hours of just like test after test. I did have a break in the middle, which was nice, but I was like completely like dead afterwards. But the behavioral observations were kind of just like a summary of the behavior I was exhibiting during the, during all the tests. Um, and essentially like I read my report and that was just kind of like one of the sections and my psychologist basically said that, you know, I was acting or like I was trying my best on the tests. I wasn't, you know, faking anything or anything like that. So the ADOS 2 is a specific assessment design for autism. Um, and it's broken down into three sections. Uh, and those three sections are communication, social interaction, and communication plus social interaction. Um, so it's kind of interesting because all the scores like I got on like the ADOS, like if you took all of them into account, like a, a clinician could make the case that I don't have autism basically based on that test. Um, one of my scores though was like in the range like for ASD and that was for social interaction. Um, but I will say like during the whole kind of like process I was like masking even though like at the time I wasn't fully aware of like what I was doing and I think like I naturally just have a hard time masking for very long periods of time um which is kind of funny because I think a lot of people in my life like wouldn't you know, they wouldn't really pick up on some of the things I do to mask. Um, but it is very much like a coping, like, skill that I've learned um, throughout my life in terms of just, like, trying to learn how to be neurotypical and survive. Like, I, I feel like a lot of neurodivergent people um, feel that way in terms of, like, masking even when you're not fully aware. But it's, it's always, like, uh, I'm always masking when I'm around other people. And... Sometimes I'll even mask when I'm by myself. Okay, so next is the IQ test. Um, and I guess I'll mention that, you know, the company I, um, I went through um, is very experienced in terms of like making like IE, e, IEP plans or like they're very experienced in terms of like um, assessing for learning disabilities and things like that. And the IQ test is like a very, um, you know, kind of standard procedure in terms of like, you know, evaluating typically children. Um, but, you know, basically like my IQ score wasn't really anything like, that was pretty average. <laughs> um, 
Uh, it's kind of interesting though, because my psychologist said that my cognitive profile, which is just kind of like looking at, you know, me holistically, like I pretty much like fit in like the ADHD category. Um, which was like kind of nice to be validated in that. It's like, I, I struggle a lot with, um, working memory or short-term memory and yeah, the IQ test basically, you know, help confirm that, um, you know, even, even though like I have created so many kind of like elaborate things to help me get by in the world, it's still like very apparent that I have a lot of issues in terms of working memory and having that was really helpful because typically in school, like you use a lot of things for working memory. And if you're somebody who just has like deficits in those, um, it can really make you feel like you're stupid or that you're just not trying hard enough, but that really just isn't the case. Um, but my psychologist, she didn't give me a, like my full scale IQ. So just like one number to describe me. Um, and the reason why she did that is because there was like a really large discrepancy between my scores and she felt that giving me one composite score uh, would not necessarily be helpful. Um, I had like one score that was like above average and I had, you know, one which was my working memory that was like really below average and you know, just kind of averaging those out wouldn't really tell anybody like what I'm good at and what I struggle with. So the brief A measures executive functioning skills um, and executive functioning includes like a lot of different um, behaviors and skills. So things like attention, organization, planning, prioritization, starting tasks and following them through, self-monitoring um, and emotion regulation. And a lot of people with ADHD or autism, like they struggle with executive functioning and my results clearly indicated that. Um, and you know, I very much confirm with that, uh, executive functioning is something like I've struggled with my entire life and I feel like I've only recently gotten a better handle on it, but it's like, <laughs> I've had to do, you know, so many other things that neurotypical people don't have to do in terms of like trying to just appear average. Um, and so it was, it was validating to kind of like hear that and see that my scores reflected that. So the sustained attention test is a test that measures your attention and impulsivity. It's generally one that's used to like validate like ADHD um, because attention and impulsivity are typically things that people with ADHD struggle with. Um, but it's kind of interesting because like the scores I got like did not really put me in the range for that. Um, but you know, like I, I still have ADHD and my psychologist, you know, very much noted that I was, you know, medicated and like, it's taken me a while to find a medication that really works for me. And so I think that really helps. And I mean, I definitely know, I can tell the difference when I'm medicated versus not medicated in terms of like my ADHD symptoms. Um, and I mean, you know, this day I was medicated, I had eaten before, like there was a lot of things that really helped improve my attention and impulsivity. Okay, but next is the Millen Clinical Multi-Axle Inventory number four. Um, and it's a test that measures personality like disorders. Um, and so my psychologist had me take this test because um, my mother had a mental illness that it's very common for the, like, offspring of the parents to have a personality disorder. Um, and so basically, like, I took the test and, uh, my psychologist noted that, like, I didn't have any, like, distinct, like, personality pathology. Um, I will say, though, that, like, she did notice that, like, my scores and some scales were elevated. Uh, however, she was very good and I think like a really good clinician in terms of like evaluating my other experiences and identities. So for instance, being like a transgender person and a queer person, um, I don't always feel safe like when I talk to strangers. Uh, and I think that's pretty fair. Um, 
you know, and I'm kind of standoffish when I first meet people and, you know, I can relate that to also just, you know, my minoritized identities or, you know, it can be like my experience in the past. Um, growing up with a very mentally ill parent made things kind of unstable and I think like like I'm just now kind of like untangling a lot of that work but in the past like I was definitely you know a mix of uh those two things um so in essence like if you are considering getting like formally evaluated for ASD I would really make sure um and especially like if you are like queer, person of color, or trans, or have other like minoritized identities that you have a clinician who's somewhat experienced in that, who's able to take into account like your lived experiences um, in a good way that isn't necessarily pathological. But in the end, my psychologist diagnosed me with autism spectrum disorder level one without intellectual or language impairment and ADHD primarily inattentive and generalized anxiety disorder. Um, so how I felt like when I initially got my diagnosis, like I didn't really know how to feel. Um, I will say like, so after the like day of testing, um, it took about like three weeks for my psychologist to kind of like process everything and write up like a 10 page report basically. Um, and so like I had waited and during that time I was you know, kind of anxious, but I was also in school, so I was, you know, doing other stuff to distract me. But, um, like, it, I will say it felt nice to feel affirmed in my experiences and that I wasn't, like, overreacting or being dramatic or, you know, anything like that. Like, everything I was experiencing, um, and, you know, a good way to sum that up is, like, I don't feel like other everybody else. Um, even when, like, I take into account, like, my upbringing or, um, you know, being queer or trans, uh, in particular, like, looking back, though, a lot, a lot of my childhood experiences is pretty painful, um, and, like, I can see, like, you know, just comparing my experiences like if I just like comparing my experiences between like not having a diagnosis versus like you know what my life could have been like if I had a diagnosis to get that help um it's kind of painful <laughs> I will say that it's a solve it's very frustrating and that's that was what I was feeling a lot and so you know for someone who has gone through the process and you're feeling that like that's totally normal and I mean, like, I don't really have family in my life anymore that I'm, like, close to. And so, like, I can't really process a lot of these feelings I have um, with, you know, people who, like, raise me. And so sometimes it feels kind of weird, I guess, um, just, like, knowing that. And it's like, damn, I kind of wish things would have been different. But, you know, I'm also kind of grateful, I guess. <laughs> um like, I think with a lot of perspective and time, like, I've developed different feelings about it. But at first, you know, I wasn't really sure how I felt. And I think that's totally fine. And that's pretty common for autistic people to have a bunch of feelings, but not necessarily be able to name them. But, you know, I think after engaging in the community and just really doing a lot of self-reflection, like, I was able to... Um, kind of come to like a internal peace with it and so just you know be patient with yourself and take some time to really think about it and don't be afraid to like feel whatever you're feeling in that moment so how I feel about it now is interesting and I'll just you know say again that I got diagnosed in 2018 and now it's 2020 and it's been you know about two years and I will say this, like, one thing, so, like, the testing accommodations I got were incredibly helpful. Um, like, I, as I said earlier, like, I grew up not having testing accommodations or really any accommodations in school, and, like, I didn't realize, like, how much they really helped me, and, I mean, I think 
an interesting video I could talk about was could be on like you know how ADHD and ASD has affected me academically um because like I don't really perceive myself as being like smarter than other people or anything like that like I think I'm just pretty average um but yeah like looking back like when I took the ACTs like wow having those accommodations would have really helped me um and you know I feel comfortable enough sharing like the accommodations I get are like being in a distraction reduced environment and I get time and a half on tests and quizzes um and yeah I mean like they seem like so small and like really like fairly easy to accommodate but for me they have made like such a difference and I was a decent student like I wasn't like incredibly gifted by any means um but you know like I can tell the difference like when I take a test and I'm able to actually focus on just the test and not be distracted by every single noise around me or you know just being in just being aware that I have enough time to fill everything out is really nice um because before it really just felt really ru rushed and my work reflected that so it's kind of nice that I'm able to you know show that I am capable when I'm just given like the right kind of accommodations but in general like emotionally how I feel about it I, I still sometimes feel frustrated um but it's it's more nuanced now it definitely is um like it it still hurts to think about like the confusion and isolation and depression that kind of resulted of me being undiagnosed for so long and just kind of living and trying to survive um but you know like i also have a found newfound like appreciation like i have complicated feelings on masking in general but like i have a pretty good masking ability and like that's helpful i mean it sucks that i have to mask to you know be seen as someone with value but like you know it still is helpful and i mean it still has helped me like form friendships and get through small talk <laughs> um but you know there's other things i feel kind of grateful for like you know along with like my masking, like I've learned to be very ob observant and very patient and kind of creative in terms of like how I problem solve. And that is something I don't necessarily think a lot of like neurotypical people or some neurodivergent people can really say. Um, and I think that's partly because of my personality and how I was raised, but you know, I generally think like my autism has helped me with that. It helped it kind of put me in a situation where I had to form new creative solutions by being patient and observant. Um, and I mean, I'm also kind of helpful that, you know, maybe it was kind of okay that I didn't get diagnosed because like there's a lot of weird fad diets and like weird treatments that people have definitely used on their kids to try and cure autism. And I think especially, like, looking back in, like, the early 2000s and the 90s, you know, I might have gotten lucky because, you know, my mom wasn't, like, super well-read in terms of, like, understanding the research out there. Um, and so maybe, maybe I avoided it. And, you know, like, ABA therapy is, like, a whole other can of worms, but I think it's fair to say that there are some bad ABA companies out there and, you know what kind of person would I be if I went through ABA as a child and it was kind of a bad experience. But, you know, I mean, you're just kind of given the cards you're dealt with and you play them as you will. And, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. But, you know, if I had to, like, if I were able to go back in time and, like, tell myself or, like, you know, if I got the chance to do this process over again, um, I honestly would 
go through it again. Like, I'm really happy I went through the process. I definitely know there's some complicated feelings between, like, you know, getting a self-diagnosis or um, getting a professional diagnosis versus a self-diagnosis. And it's a really complicated topic, but, you know, for me, it was really validating to get that experience. And I mean, it really, really helped me understand just how my brain works and like, you know, what I can do to kind of set myself up for success. And I don't know if I would have necessarily gotten that specific information from just doing a self-diagnosis. And I think it's helpful in terms of like being able to articulate what I struggle with in turn in very like clinical terms because you know a lot of times you're gonna have to be your own self-advocate and so having the language just really helps but you know at the end of the day this is just like how I feel about it I'm not trying to say like everybody needs to get a professional diagnosis to feel valid but for me this is what helped me feel valid and yeah I mean that's to me what is the most important part. But I just wanna say if you made it this far, thank you for listening to my story about how I got diagnosed with ASD. Um, I hope that you found this video helpful in some way or form. Um, you know, if you know someone who's going through that process or just wants to learn more, maybe send them this video or something. Um, and yeah, comment below if you wanna like see other types of videos. Um, but yeah, thank you all for watching. Hope you have a great day.